Hi, good afternoon and welcome after a sumptuous lunch to this workshop. This workshop uh, is entitled Legal Challenges Before Internationalized Domain Names. This is being organized by cyberlaws.net, which is a, a unique uh, consultancy on cyber law. We work on all issues. I am uh, Pavan Dugal. I am the president of cyberlaws.net and also a practicing attorney in the Indian Supreme Court working on various legal issues pertaining to technology and uh, uh, related aspects. Today, we have a very interesting, distinguished, and diverse panel. The panel consists of people who've done remarkable work in the area of ideas. The topic that we chose was obviously a very ticklish one. It still continues to be ticklish a couple of months later as well. Well, we've all been talking about ideas, but uh, what are the legal issues pertaining to ideas? Are there legal issues, or is it just a cakewalk? Well, to go more into it, to find out uh, what are the pitfalls, what are the things that people working in IDNs need to be careful about, we have this distinguished panel. On my immediate left is uh, Ram Mohan, who is the Chief Technology Officer, Vice President of uh, Phileas, and also on the ICANN board, a man who I know for the last so many years, and more importantly, a friend who's done such a lot of work in the area of IDNs. On my immediate right is uh, Mr. Bahir Ismat, who is the manager, regional relations, Middle East, global partnerships of ICANN. And uh, he today is here to represent the position of ICANN on IDNs and the latest that ICANN has in this space. Clearly, ICANN is the central uh, stakeholder in this entire regime that's going to be built up. And uh, on my extreme right is Hong Xiu, who is uh, from Chinese domain name Users Alliance. She's got a tremendous legal background and has worked a lot in these areas. We are supposed to be joined by Tina Dam of uh, ICANN remotely, as also by Khalid Fatil of uh, multilingual domain names and Mink. But I'm told that the technology invariably uh, is not up to the mark. We still don't have connectivity. So hopefully, if we are able to have connectivity, we could have them join in remotely. But I think we like to uh, begin straight away. I would like to just, at the very outset, just give a broad outline of some of the issues that I think are going to be relevant in this space. And then we will invite our respected uh, panelists in this regard. I'll have to go that side to begin. Yeah, when you talk about uh, legal issues, you invariably have uh, visions of lawyers coming in and, of course, trying to steal the thunder. But trust me, here is an area that even lawyers are not aware of how the regime is going to evolve. And I think my presentation here is going to open up more questions than the answers. But clearly, I think when we talk about internationalized domain names, one thing is very clear. Whatever they are, they're going to be implemented very soon in the near future. But as they are going to be implemented, there are going to be various legal issues that impact the successful implementation and continuation of the IDNs as a regime. Now, I thought, let me try to crystallize some various parameters, some various areas which could be of potential concentration of energies. These, I think, are the areas where issues would arise or could arise. I may be completely wrong. It might be some crystal grazing, but let me try. Uh, the first major legal issues will be relate to implementation of the IDN regime. The second major category will be the issues pertaining to the IDN operator or the service provider who is selected to run the IDN. The third, of course, uh, important area of potential legal controversy will be IDNs and registries. The IDN registry will have a huge number of challenges up their hands. The fourth area is going to be registrars. They are surely also going to face some problems in this regard. And users, mind you, they are the last. They are uh, taken for granted. But users in IDNs will have far more say in how legal issues are going to be determined. And 
Apart from these, there are some other stakeholder areas that will have some potential aspects. How about dispute resolution? This is going to be critical. How will disputes pertaining to IDNs be effectively resolved? IDN and security is going to be another major area where there will be potential legal ramifications. Cyber crimes and IDNs are not invariably associated together, but that's one another category that uh, IDNs will face legal challenges because cyber crimes will now wait for another fertile platform to launch. And another major area will be IDNs and national sovereignty of governments. This is an area of hot debate for the last few months. Uh, it, no final word is yet been said, but clearly this will be yet another area. And finally, another age, area that I could identify was ICANN and national governments and their respective relationships outside of the existing parameters. When we talk about uh, the current implementation process, there are a couple of legalities pertaining to the fast track process that's proposed to be adopted by ICANN. 26th of November 2008, ICANN uploads the updated, revised draft implementation plan. This time, it's for public comments. The comments invited till 9th of January 2009. Now, the community comments are sought on a variety of issues that have been detailed in the draft implementation plan. Gives you a great amount of clarity and vision on how it is proposed to move forward, as far as ICANN is concerned, on IDNs. But if one goes through that, and if one goes through various other documentations and policy issues, we realize the focus is coming back to one central issue which is due diligence by the operator for an IDN CCTLD. So it's a hands-off approach where the emphasis is go going to go back on due diligence by the concerned operator. Self-certification is another major aspect of the proposed way forward. You certify that you have complied. Neither will ICANN nor will its committees be standing guarantee to what you are saying. Yes, tomorrow there could be some potential discrepancies that could be found. But be that as it may, the initial onus of proving that you have complied lies with you as an, I, as an IDN operator. Apart from these two fundamental pyramids on which the building, uh, the foundation on which the pyramid is going to be built, we do find that there is an absence of a dispute resolution mechanism in the fast track. That's something that hits you immediately when you look into the entire document. You also find that there is no mechanism to challenge the termination process. Well, if you look at the detailed chart 5.1 given in the uh, document of 26th of November, you find everything terminating at a termination process. But what happens after the termination process? What happens if people want to challenge the termination process? Unfortunately, there are some gray areas. We still ha don't have the document doesn't have the answers. Maybe I think the answers will come as we go along. But another major issue comes in, fast track vis-a-vis -vis national sovereignty. Not much clarity. Currently, it's experimental. Currently, it's beginning. But are governments in line? Is the thought process over? Has the final word yet been said? I think a lot of the debate still remains to be seen as far as this aspect is concerned. There are some other ticklish issues that are likely to come in. How about issues for countries which have multiple national languages and multiple scripts? Currently, it's going to be fast track. It's going to be one national language, one script. But how about those countries where there is a multiplicity of choice? How about uh, issues concerning the same language, same script, but different countries? What's going to be the position on that? Not much clarity, but I think we will find a way as we go along. Another issue that is important is adherence to international standards and norms. So the IDNA protocol, the IDN guidelines are the current two flagged ones. But clearly, there are also reference to other applicable policies, existing policies, consensus policies that are likely to emerge for which compliance will have to be done by the IDNs and the IDN operator. We'll have to see how this emerges as the time passes by, but these are clearly legal issues. But clearly, the focus is on transparency. The focus is on accountability, as far as this new regime is con concerned. We've learned through the historical mistakes, and I think they are now studiously being sought to be avoided in the new regime that is bound to be now done. OK. Everybody's talking about IDN. Where is the IDN policy? 
Is there a document? What should be the essential features of this final, finalized IDN policy? Uh, that's one area that still a lot of work needs to be done. And what is the final policy on fast track? There's some confusion, some doubt, some debate. People talk, well, what's uploaded is only a proposed draft implementation plan. What is uploaded is not the final IDN policy for fast track. So some confusions, but I think as we go along, there could be some clarities coming in this regard. IDN tables are critical in moving forward. So you as an operator, or you as a registry, there are going to be self-certification on IDN tables. Self-certification is going to be fine. There's going to be various levels of access of, uh, uh, shall I say, analysis. But in case of deficiencies of in the table, what is the way forward? What has to be done? Currently, not much clarity. In fact, uh, there's no clarity moving forward in that regard. And what are the mechanisms for sorting out the troubles in the implementation of the IDN CCTLDs is another area that a lot of work needs to be done. These are still virgin territories, where, which are now just been beginning to be talked about. But the final word on the same is yet remaining to be uttered. There's a reference in various documentations about consensus policies. What are those consensus policies? Are they elaborated? What, what are the essential features of them? Similarly, what would be the general registration policies for IDNs? Uh, are there some templates? Are there some requirements, some norms? What would be the variant registration policy? And how will the variant registration policy be different vis-a-vis -vis different tables, vis-a-vis -vis different IDNs? Questions for which currently we are all beginning to seek answers. Termination process, as we said, details are yet to be fully developed. Uh, it's acknowledged yet that it's not been fully developed, but this is one area that work will have to be done. Similarly, when you talk about the issue of identical or confusingly similar two strings, what's going to happen? What is the way forward? How are things going to be resolved? Still work to be done. Confidential? Yes. Fast track requests are confidential. We don't know them. But there's already a dichotomy of sorts. You have confidentiality of fast track uh, requests for IDNs, CCTLDs, but you have public, or proposed to be public, new GTLD requests. So a traditional classical conflict of confidential versus public is likely to be played out in this arena as well. Respected stakeholders will potentially take legal positions on this. Well, it has to be, you know, oranges have to be compared with oranges, and apples have to be compared with apples. How will that principle lie in this scenario is something that really needs to be unfolded as the time passes by. What's going to be the review process? Currently, not much known. A lot of people talk about the so-called experimental nature of the fast track. Some people call it temporary. The, the draft. Uh, says, well, it's going to be permanent. But yes, it's still going to be temporary. It's going to be transient. The significance and the applicability of these words, experimental, transient, temporary, permanent, is yet to sink in. But what will be the respective legal obligations vis-a-vis -vis these four different categories uh, of words and operators that will fall under this is clearly yet not known at the time when I'm talking with you. But surely, these are areas of tremendous debate. Again, another major problem in the implementation that we could potentially flag is the proposed delegation process versus the attempt to force countries to sign. The argument that, well, under the garb of this so-called delegation, I can will effectively force CCTLDs and companies to sign, uh, thereby impacting sovereignty, vis-a-vis -vis proposed delegation process is something that we are beginning to see debate, but still last words not yet said. I think successful trials and implementation will happen subject to an enabling policy framework of IDNs in place. And for that, it's important that each and every aspect of the policy needs to be well documented and well made available in the public domain. Dispute resolution policy is going to be absolutely critical for IDNs. Yes, dispute resolution. It was an essential feature of the current uh, stage of uh, TLDs. And for IDNs, it's going to be even more. 
Is there going to be a uniform domain name dispute resolution policy for IDNs? Uh, well, if logic says yes, why not? Uh, that's the, the proven way of uh, success. We should do this. But would the existing UDRP suffice? Surely not. Existing UDRP, very limited. Even WIPO is now thinking about uh, coming up with various recommendations on revisions. But clearly, in the current scenario, existing UDRP will have to be supplemented by a large number of elements. And, but what changes would need to be taken and undertaken in the current UDRP uh, to make them fully applicable to IDNs? I think a lot of work, thought process needs to be done in this regard. Well, when you're talking about dispute resolution, I think we have to be alive to the fact that given the unique nature of IDN's dependence on their respective languages, it's but natural to expect that the requirements of the IDN UDRP will differ from existing UDRP requirements for TLDs and CCTLDs. But what are the salient features? Yet to be developed, yet to be discussed, yet to be enacted. Confusingly similar was a good concept to understand in normal GTLDs, in .com, .net, .car. In English, in ASCII. Confusingly similar in IDNs, how do, we, how do we propose to deal with them? This is going to be a Pandora's box. If that's not sufficient, how about legitimate rights of the applicant? How will the applicant of an IDN show that he has legitimate rights on the concerned IDN domain name? If that's not sufficient, how does he show that there is a lack of a legitimate rights of the actual registrant of the concerned IDN? All this is on the implicit presumption that IDNs will still continue to be based on a first-come, first-served basis. How about bad faith in IDNs? How do you dis determine bad faith? We've got more than 6,000 odd cases of jurisprudence as far as existing UDRP is concerned on bad faith. But bad faith in IDNs? How are we going to do about that? It's a different parameters altogether. Earlier, we were dealing with birds. We are now going to be dealing with elephants. Clearly, we need to be equipped with different mechanisms, different tools and strategies to deal with different uh, target areas. And finally, protection of intellectual property rights of legal entities in the IDN space. How do we propose to deal with that? That's something that will engage a huge time and attention of the legal community, as also the communities whose legal rights are at stake. Trademark and related issues, how will they be dealt with in IDNs? Clearly, major legal issues to be addressed. Successful running of the IDN would require focus on security issues. Uh, similarly, infrastructure issues and deficiency of service issues will also somewhere crop up their necks as we go along in our pursuit of effectively implementing the IDNs. Well, these were some of the IPR issues. But when you're talking about dispute resolution, you will ultimately talk about local dispute resolution in the context of IDNs. Now, therefore, it will be absolutely imperative that we need to have local dispute resolution centers which are familiar with the relevant languages. Gone will be the good old days of the generic uh, arbitrators and panel of neutrals for normal TLDs. We'll, have, we'll begin to see emergence of specific language specific, IDN specific uh, uh, arbitrators and panels of neutrals as we go along. Tremendous significance, of course, of the language experts and linguistic experts in this scenario cannot be questioned. It also means one more thing. There's going to be increased availability of vernacular content which means that there's an absolute need for taking inputs from the local vernacular communities. I think the community is concerned that ultimately there should be seamless integration of IDNs with existing TLDs and CCTLDs. So for that, uh, there's a need for a proactive approach, both by ICANN as also by the governments. OK, how about? One more bouncer, as they call it in the cricket language. The rights of registries to the names IDN.IDN. Who will have them? Who will not have them? Will they have them? Will they not have them? Good questions, no answers. OK, let me complicate the matter further. How much right of users from ABC.com to ABC.IN, IDN, and then from ABC IDN to dot .cctld .idn? to ABC IDN dot TLD IDN. Still huge areas. Are we going to be having automatic uh, rights? 
our registrants going to say, hold on, I registered pavandugal.com in English, so I have rights to all pavan in all vernaculars, in all languages, in all IDNs. I, I have rights to the say, combination in all IDNs. I have the right to the name pavandugal in all languages, in all scripts. I think we are just beginning to scratch the surface. The surface promises that this is going to be a tumultuous time. This is going to be possibly the biggest time of litigation as far as domain names is going to happen. This is potentially going to be the time of potential huge legal consequences and legal exposure. All I can say is it's a Pandora's box. If you open it up, it's just waiting to be opened up. And you realize how the genie is going to come out of it. But clearly, these, these bridges will have to be walked as we walk along. GNSO has taken the view, well, hold on, no guarantees. Hold on, it's going to be first come, first serve. Well, if that's going to happen, and that Pandora's box gets opened up, I think we are potentially going to see a replay of the Wild Wild West in the context of the IDNs. There's going to be a potential exposure to high potential consequences and litigation which cannot be ruled out. Of course, I'll be very happy to ultimately be proved wrong, wrong but from a, a trained lawyer and legal professional, I do believe that these are areas where people would not mind litigating for protecting their legal interests. But litigation where? Is it going to be California, where ICANN is located? Is it going to be national courts and national jurisdictions of sovereign countries? Where, how, when, what kind of legal proceedings unfold is anybody's guess as we move around. If that's not sufficient, there comes the issue of security. How secure are IDNs? Uh, is there going to be a, a legal exposure for lack of security of IDNs? Can't be ruled out. Some national jurisdictions are now making uh, these service providers, these operators, within the ambit of network service providers. And they are being made liable for third party data. India, the land that you're currently sitting, is one such classical example where network service providers are made liable under the Indian cyber law for all third party data or information made available by them. Clearly, the liability for potential lack of security could be invoked in a huge generic legislation like this. How about IDNs and cyber crimes? Cyber crimes like phishing, a typical example. The PayPal case, just the beginning, but certainly not the end. We go along, we find far more innovative uses of the potential IDN regimes. The focus of all these activities are likely to be deception of the large target audience being the users of the IDNs. This is going to be a big major challenge, regulatory challenge, in terms of avoiding any potential legal consequences. I think there are many more relevant issues. I can't see them currently now, but I can trust, I can promise you, there are going to be far, far more that are yet not foreseeable, but will definitely arise. And I think we will need the bandwidth and the ability to deal with these issues as we go along. But a lot of work still needs to be done in the area of policy regulation of IDN. The issue of policy-related uh, uh, aspects of IDN have to be addressed. Somewhere, the beginning has to be made in a more institutionalized manner. But I think all efforts must currently still be made for successful testing and implementation of IDNs. Bottom line is, whether it's the users, whether it's the operators, whether it's the countries, everybody is crying for an open, transparent, and proactive approach. I think availability and resolution of IDNs to vernacular content will be another potential area that could have potential policy ramifications. Still not tested, but these are areas to flag for the future for which we could have problems. ICANN needs to have a far more enabling policy aimed for the growth of the IDNs. I think tremendous contribution and input is required from all stakeholders, not just ICANN. It's from the governments, it's from linguistic experts, vernacular constituencies, and finally netizens and users in order to make IDNs working success as also the effective implementation of the same for the seamless integration along with the existing and proposed TLDs and uh, CCTLDs. Uh, with that, I thought I wanted to just give a broad overview of what I think are the potential legal issues. I will pause here and I'll take this opportunity to invite straight away Bahir to come in here and give the perspectives of ICANN as to what is now ICANN doing on these legal issues and then we proceed forward. Over to you. The floor is all yours. Bahir, thanks.
Okay. Uh, is the technical people, can we uh, take your assistance? The audio feed is not going through. Could we work on them, please? Thank you. Thank you for updating that. We have been trying. Uh, the internet is down. We, we are not able to connect. Tina was supposed to be with us. But can I request the, the, the technical people, can from the, somebody from the IGF or from the Dim Dim people, can you please ensure at, the, at least the audio and the video output goes so that people can actually listen. I would meanwhile nonetheless uh, invite Bahir to come in and give your presentation. Thank you, Pavan. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bahar Asmat. I'm with ICANN, and I'm actually uh, delivering uh, these slides on behalf of my colleague, Tina Dam, the director of the IDN program, who unfortunately couldn't uh, make it to the uh, meeting. So I'll try to keep closer to the microphone. Uh, so. Um, the, uh, the slides will uh, try to uh, touch upon a uh, number of uh, areas that uh, Pavan has uh, highlighted in his um, uh, introductory remarks, um, uh, from mainly from ICANN's perspective when it comes to uh, uh, legal issues pertaining to uh, IDNs. Uh, I'm going to address the, um, the issues from different levels, from the user registrant level, uh, from the um, contractual relationship with, with ICANN level, uh, from technical as well as application uh, uh, levels. Uh, generally, as you all know, the, um, uh, the IDNs is changing the whole uh, domain name space uh, from uh, the uh, limited number of uh, characters supported by the ASCII DNS to a uh, huge number of characters from different uh, uh, scripts. Uh, it's therefore um, uh, uh, expected that the uh, confusability uh, will increase. So um, like in, in the ASCII world, we used to have a small number of, of uh, confusability issues like between digit 1 and letter L, digit 0 and letter O. Uh, so probably this will uh, increase by an order of magnitude uh, with the uh, introduction of IDNs at the top level. Uh, the, uh, the question is whether the increased confusability will lead to increased uh, of legal issues, and this is what the presentation is about. Uh, the, uh, the thing about expanding the domain name uh, space is something that the community has uh, been working on for a uh, uh, few years, and the, um, the policy recommendation that the GNSO, the G Generic Name Supporting Organization under ICANN has come up with, uh, actually decided to open the, um, uh, the generic uh, space for uh, more uh, uh, top-level uh, strings. So the, um, the, uh, the legal issues here are not only related to IDNs and whether or not IDNs are uh, uh, being introduced, it's also related to the expansion of the space uh, itself. Uh, one uh, uh, remark in relation to the, uh, the trademark issue. A uh, long time ago there was uh, an RFC, uh, 1591, it's very famous for those working in DNS uh, uh, field. Uh, so in this uh, RFC it uh, was stated very clearly that uh, the registry and registrar have no role on determining the ownership of a domain name. Uh, and also the registrant himself uh, he has no uh, right, no trademark right in any names in any name he's trying to register. Uh, that's to say that he's responsible to uh, uh, to 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 be aware whether or not for his his making any uh, trademark um, uh, violation or infringement. Uh, if we go to the um, back to the uh, IDN second level domains which were introduced back in 2003 and currently there are uh, a number of uh, registries that uh, offer um, uh, domain uh, registrations, IDN domain registration on second level. Um, uh, we, we've tried to get some, some statistics and from what we 
uh, have found publicly on the WIPO side was that uh, there has been 56 uh, UDRP cases uh, with, with IDN uh, second level domains. And this is of course a very small portion of the uh, many thousands uh, uh, disputes uh, on, on uh, the, the ASCII uh, uh, domain uh, names. Uh, and th there wasn't any uh, reporting back to, to ICANN that you know, uh, dispute uh, resolution providers have uh, faced any uh, difficulties dealing with the, the IDN disputes. Uh, however, it's expected again in the future that the um, uh, dispute resolution providers will have to uh, expand their uh, capacity and expertise to be able to deal with the um, anticipated uh, 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 number of, of uh, new uh, uh, IDNs, uh, both on the top level and on the, uh, the, second, uh, the second level. Uh, talking about the uh, two of the key processes that are currently going on within ICANN and which Pavan has also touched upon, uh, the uh, IDN CCTLDs and the IDN GTLDs. So in the CCTLDs, we're referring to this process uh, uh, as, as a fast track. Fast track is simply, it's a quick mechanism to uh, implement uh, IDN CCTLDs. Uh, and why did we need a quick mechanism? Because uh, CCNSO, which is the uh, country code name supporting organization under ICANN, they realized that if they were going to work on a uh, policy development process for introducing IDN CCTLDs, that this would have taken them several years. And they are still working on this, so they're not giving it up. They are going to work and they're going to start a PDP on IDN CCTLDs. However, due to the demand uh, coming from the community, from the CC community uh, uh, for, for IDNs, the decision was to start a fast track process which is uh, not supposed to preempt any uh, policy uh, on the longer term uh, PDP uh, process. So uh, this uh, fast track thing uh, has been an effort uh, that was mainly undertaken by the CCNSO as well as the Government Advisory Committee under ICANN with uh, many uh, feedback coming from other uh, constituencies like GNSO and uh, ALAC, the at-large uh, community. Um, and they, uh, uh, they submitted their uh, recommendation to the board, and the board uh, uh, approved it and asked the, uh, the staff to work on an implementation plan. Uh, the staff started working on that and posted the um, uh, first uh, version of the draft implementation plan uh, by end of October, uh, which was a week before the ICANN annual meeting in Cairo. Uh, then the, uh, there were many discussions during the Cairo meeting on the same report, and last week I can posted an updated version of, of that report, and it's available on the ICANN's website for public comments. Um, and uh, the, the public comment period is going to be uh, open till uh, January 7th, 2009. The main uh, open issues uh, in, in that report uh, are uh, mainly around some legal aspects in relation to uh, the um, relationship between the potential IDN CCTLDs and ICANN. Uh, historically, uh, CCTLDs uh, uh, didn't need to have any uh, kind of formal uh, relationship with ICANN uh, because they actually uh, were operating their CCTLDs long time before ICANN was um, uh, created. Uh, and then in the past few years, ICANN uh, started to um, uh, implement a kind of framework agreements and to encourage uh, 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 CCTLDs uh, to, um, uh, to, to sign such agreements, however it was never been forced uh, to, to them. Now the, the status is, is a bit different with the coming IDN CCTLDs for the simple reason that ICANN needs to ensure uh, stability of the domain name system and to ensure that the um, 
the IDN CCTLD operator is going to uh, comply with the technical uh, standards, the IDN technical standards. And this is a complex area. And I'm sure that Tram in his uh, uh, talk is going to touch upon the details of, of these issues. Uh, the um, the other uh, area, the other open area in, in, in the fast track um, uh, implementation plan uh, draft uh, is in relation to uh, the contention uh, between strings, uh, whether it's a contention between an IDN CCTLD string and an existing uh, uh, TLD. Uh, or it's a, a, a contention between uh, two uh, new uh, uh, TLDs. One is CC via the fast track, and one is uh, G via the new GTLD uh, process. And ICANN is seeking actually input from from community on those on those areas. So it would be very important for us to hear what the uh, community uh, uh, thinks about those those issues. Uh, so as I said, the, 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 uh, the draft implementation plan is available for, for comments and feedback till uh, January 7th. Now the other uh, parallel process is the new GTLD program, uh, which IDN actually is part uh, of. Uh, and uh, it's important to note that uh, in relation to the contractual relationship with ICANN, that's not an issue with the GTLD registries because historically GTLD registries used to have and are still having uh, uh, agreements with, with ICANN. And this is supposed to be the case with the future uh, GTLD uh, registries. Uh, However, there are still cases or issues with uh, contention. Uh, ICANN is uh, proposing some uh, mechanisms to deal with uh, contention uh, issues through some uh, uh, algorithm as well as panel uh, reviews. Uh, however, all this is currently under, uh, again, it's part of the draft implementation plan of the uh, new GTLD, and uh, the, the, um, the uh, comments on that is very, is very helpful. Uh, the comments on the new GTLD thing is open till December 8th, so it's it's going to be, is it 15th? Okay, so uh, it's uh, it has been extended to December 15th. So again, uh, I would encourage you to uh, have a look at the um, the draft and provide your your feedback. Sure. Right. Till January 7th. Okay, so I, I checked the, the website a couple of days ago and that was not there. So, thank you. So, the, the, there has been a number of, of um, um, like, the, 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 there have been several translations to the uh, draft implementation plan in several languages. Uh, so, uh, if you're going to provide your input in a language different than the English, then you have till uh, January 7th. Uh, the other uh, area that uh, also um, uh, a bit of an issue, uh, a legal issue, is um, uh, in relation to geographical names like city names or uh, country names. If, if a new GTLD applicant wants to uh, apply for such a name, then what, what ICANN is suggesting in the draft implementation plan, and again this has not been approved yet, is to for the applicant to get a, a supporting uh, document from the government or the public authority that is um, uh, uh, responsible for this uh, name of a city or uh, a place. Um, another area of, of um, uh, legal dimension, though it's more of a technical area, is the language table or the IDN table or the variant table, whatever we call them. We, for, for, for implementing IDNs, the registry uh, needs to have a table. And this table becomes more... Um, uh, vital uh, when it comes to uh, languages uh, that are used across one script, uh, like the case. Um, sorry, uh, it's uh, with with a, sc a script that is used across different languages, like the case with uh, the Arabic script, for instance, which is used across several several languages. So there uh, has to be a, a table to list the characters that the registry uh, is going to use in his. Uh, registration uh, system. Uh, so the absence of such a table uh, is expected to be problematic because it's expected that more disputes will uh, ar 
arise if there isn't uh, any uh, uh, policy uh, being set by the uh, registry uh, itself. Uh, so on the question of uh, whether, a, um, whether or not a registrant of a domain called uh, idn.tld, uh, whether or not he has a uh, legal right in uh, the idn.idn domain, uh, well, this question has uh, been raised several times over the past year. And the simple answer to that question is there is no guarantee. Uh, there is no guarantee because if we look at the top level, uh, still the, uh, the policy that was uh, developed by GNSO for the uh, new GTLD program uh, stated that uh, there is no precedence for uh, a GTLD registry to become an IDN GTLD registry. means that uh, if there is a... Uh, registry for a certain top level domain like dot museum for instance that doesn't mean that the same registry will automatically become the registry for any translation for dot museum this is what the gnso has stated in their uh, policy recommendations and they also said that uh, there are several ways of objections so uh, it is uh, uh, possible, very possible, that if a, um, there is an application for a uh, TLD uh, for like Chinese.museum, for instance, that the ASCII.museum registry would uh, object to, to, that, to that application. On, on the CCTLD side, uh, maybe the things are more um, uh, uh, be, being dealt with on, on a national level. It's, it's a sort of a local uh, policy. Uh, uh, however, the technical people believe that if we're going to uh, implement any kind of aliasing, like mapping from one domain to another, whether on a top level or a second level, uh, it's better to have such a solution uh, standardized, technically standardized. And currently, there isn't a standard for mapping or um, uh, aliasing one domain to another. There have been several implementations, but none of which were uh, standardized. So the, the conclusion or the short answer, as I said, to, to the top question is there is no guarantee because, uh, again, if, if it happens that the same registry of the ASCII domain becomes the registry of the IDN domain, then it's up to him on his own policy to decide whether the IDN second level will belong to uh, the same ASCII registrant. This is a policy thing that the, uh, the, um, the registry will uh, decide upon. Uh, on, on the application side, uh, again, it's more uh, confusing uh, because uh, when we talk about IDNs and applications, we're mainly talking about the web applications, the browsers, uh, those are the applications uh, which uh, have already implemented IDNs. Uh, and the, um, the application or the browser de uh, developers, uh, they uh, felt at some point that there um, uh, are not enough uh, policies uh, set by the registrars uh, in, in, in how to implement IDNs and how to register IDNs names. Uh, and they uh, thought that uh, if they're not, uh, uh, if they are not going to be uh, cautious, uh, they uh, may be uh, uh, sued by by end users, by uh, trademark holders, or whatever. The example that Pavan says, as mentioned about PayPal.com, for instance, is, is a famous one. So that's why the the application developers have been uh, very cautious, and that's why they started to do some uh, precautions like uh, whitelisting of safe TLDs, uh, like um, some actually browsers do not implement uh, languages that are that have characters very similar to the ASCII characters, like the Greek language, for instance, or the Cyrillic. Uh, they decided that they're not going to support such um, uh, scripts. 
uh, some browsers uh, provide or uh, give the end user like uh, warnings that uh, if he's going to uh, type a certain address or uh, uh, click on a certain URL uh, that is about to be using a language which is not currently supported by his browser and he needs to uh, do some uh, settings for that. Uh, so this is something that some application developers uh, decided to um, uh, to do uh, in order to protect uh, to protect themselves. And th there was some uh, blog by Tina Dam on this on this thing, and the link to the blog is. Uh, shown here. So in, in summary, there are uh, various uh, levels of uh, legal issues. There are too many things. Uh, some are related to the registrant himself, some are related to the registry uh, and its policies, its relationship with, with ICANN, some are related to technical issues like language tables, uh, some are related to applications. Uh, so ICANN is currently focusing on implementing IDNs at the top level while trying to learn from uh, past experiences with, with uh, second level IDNs. And I think that's it for me, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bahir. That is Bahir giving us the perspectives from uh, ICANN. And uh, just to let you know that we've been also been joined by one more panelist of us, Mr. Rajesh uh, Agrawal, who is the uh, CEO of uh, National Internet Exchange of India, and also is the, uh, the dot .in registry. Uh, but prior to that, may I request Hong to please come and give her perspectives. She is uh, from the Chinese domain name Users Alliance. Thanks, Pawan. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the dynamics between UDRP and IDNs. So I will be limited my discussion uh, in, in UD, UDRPs. A uniform domain name resolution policy was adopted in 1999 by ICANN. Uh, so after eight years, it seems that UDRP has become a very important uh, channel to resolve the disputes between trademarks and domain names. Uh, many people have been researching the nature of UDRP. Uh, what is UDRP? This is kind of a new international law. It's an interesting question. It was adopted by ICANN. And we all know ICANN is not even an intergovernmental organization. So it seems that that is not a right forum to develop an international law. But undeniably, UDRP has become a very, very important and even a primary channel uh, for the resolution of domain name disputes. Uh, so, uh, in my research, I believe UDRP could sort of be summarized as a kind of proceeding for enforcement of trademark rights. So I'm going to uh, presume the potential of UDRP and uh, uh, this perspective as a trademark enforcement proceeding and how could IDN issues be more effectively and reasonably um, be resolved in the future. Uh, as my colleague uh, Bacher has kindly uh, mentioned uh, in, in his presentation, uh, out of more than 6,000 UDRP cases, there are only 56 with respect to IDMs. So it seems that IDN has not become a mainstream problem of UDRPs in this domain name dis resolution uh, proceeding. But of course, with the openness of the, uh, of the top level domains, I guess IDN would become a very contentious issue under the UDRP. I, I basically have three points to convey with respect to the substantive issue of UDRP, uh, with additional one on the proceedings. For the three uh, substantive issues on UDRP, um, first one I want to talk about a global proceeding created by UDRP and its tension with territorial-based trademark rights. As I said, UDRP is kind of uh, enforcement for trademark rights. But what is interesting is that um, uh, once it's adopted by ICANN and, and, and um, accredited uh, a few service providers in the world to run the proceeding, it has become um, a cross-territorial. I mean, this is really a global proceeding. When you look at the complaints and response, 
the two party actually operating out of any uh, territorial uh, border. You can sue anyone who registered a domain name that's similar to your trademark. This is very interesting phenomenon and it's very new to trademark law. We know trademark law, um, um, including international trademark law, has always been territorial. Territoriality is actually the cornerstone of international IP law. International IP law it means it's harmonized the minimum protection uh, the plus the territoriality, which means you want to claim a trademark protection in certain territory, you have to prove that you have the right subsisting in that territory. There's never been such global trademark. If you believe you have a trademark, you can claim globally you are totally wrong. Even for those extremely trademark, uh, extremely well-known trademarks such as Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Uh, I, I heard um, in some country, actually, McDonald has been registered not by the McDonald in the United States. So this is very much a territorial issue. When you create a global proceeding and, and try to enforce the trademark rights on this global media, you have to think about it. You could possibly extend or stretch the territorial rights. This is the canvas of UDRP. And this is actually uh, the, the, the draw a lot of a criticism against the UDRP. It believe that uh, UDRP, if it's fair, is almost fair. It's not absolutely fair. This is because it is too pro component, uh, too uh, pro complainant, a uh, pro trademark rights. The trademark rights is same to be able to enforce globally. This is a big issue. With respect to IDN. This tension between uh, globalized proceeding and localized rise could be even more critical. And think about IDN is very much localized. It's targeting to the local language community only. You, you registered uh, uh, IDN uh, in Taragu <laughs> as a local scripts in Hyderabad. You, you're targeting to these uh, script users only. Oh. And, 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 and why a trademark is being registered, say, in Ethiopia, could be enforced against you in Hyderabad, that's a big issue. So I want to raise this. The second point is that IDN could well raise the very contentious problem of translation and transliteration of trademarks. It's always been a difficult issue for our lawyers. You have a trademark. Um, uh, oh, they have to be a character mark, not a device mark. It's never been able to be registered in any, as any domain names. You have a character trademark, and, and, and you want to claim your right uh, and legal protection for that. However, the trademark will have to be expressed it's through certain characters. It could be a, a, a trademark like McDonald. It is in, uh, we say, ASCII characters. It's in English, in Latin scripts. You have rights to that. But why you want to claim uh, McDonald in Tragu, in Hindi, in Chinese, or Japanese? There is no automatic extension to your trademark rights to um, uh, any uh, semantic in other language. This is pretty much clear. And I, I guess this is widely accepted in legal community. The second issue is that some trademarks is being registered in certain character sets, are actually generic terms. But as they have established the reputation, goodwill business as being accepted in certain communities, such as Ella. Oh, well, my French is terrible. I, I guess it means her or she. It is well-known mark in fashion business, especially the publication on a fashion um, uh, uh, <laughs> jewelries for those things. It's quite famous, very famous, very well-known. But this is means uh, the publisher could claim exclusive right over her or she in English or Ta in Chinese. That would be really ridiculous. Another example could be a boss, uh, the Hugo Boss, and the boss is also a registered trademark. So it would be really disastrous if the trademark owner can claim um, any boss in any language. I don't believe it's going to be the case. Um, uh, the last things we have to think about is how to link the well-known trademark protection uh, to IDNs. What is really interesting is that under the Berner, oh, sorry, under the Paris Convention, Article Six, this well-known trademark deserve extensive protection, but is 
Um, but it's limited to relevant public, which means it has to be recognized by relevant public. It doesn't mean you have a well-known trademark you can claim against your right um, against anyone. Then that is not true. For, the, for this translation and transliteration, it, it may well be you have a well-known trademark it, it, as the trademark it, as it is in certain character. But when it's translated into another character, it is not well-known at all. Uh, there's a case in China, IKEA. IKEA is such a famous Swedish trademark. I know Swedish people are very proud of it. Um, IKEA entered into Chinese market, but China is not an English-speaking country. Um, we don't speak English at all, and we don't like it. <laughs> um, so IKEA adopted um, a Chinese name, it's Yijia. It means suitable for family. Oh, it's such a good transliteration, it sounds so nice. So Chinese people are really well known we know very well that Yijia means, means that brand, <laughs> but we don't know IKEA. IKEA, that, that is in Latin script, is never been used in Chinese market, but somebody registered IKEA.com.cn and IKEA sued for uh, cyber scouting for trademark infringement. <laughs> it attempted to enforce is IKEA in, in ASCII <laughs> uh, uh, against the Chinese user, which normally use IJIA. This is a very interesting issue. The court finally held that it is not trademark infringement. IKEA has never been well known to Chinese public, so it's not infringing at all. What they can enforce is actually Yijia, uh, the, the, the Chinese trademark for this company. Uh, the, oh, the, the third substantive issue with respect to IDN is that <laughs> sometime uh, when we adopt an IDN at top level, UDRP would need to be revealed or reinterpreted. Re-inter- in- this is interesting. Uh, presently, the UDRP is primarily for the ASCII domain names. So when we compare whether a domain name is confusingly similar with a trademark or not, we only think about the second level. We won't think about the top level. And oh, we have so many UDRP cases demonstrate that you don't have to think about the generic term as a top level, a .com, .net, .org, no. That's not an issue at all. But when IDN is being introduced, something could, could, be, could be different. It could make big difference. I have an example. I, I don't know whether I can express in English clearly. There's a very famous and big company in, in China based in Beijing. Its name is China North. High Industry Corporation. Uh, so I, I know it's not a very distinctive company name. <laughs> um, its uh, short name is North Corporation. It is very well known in China. It, it actually registered North Corporation in in China. It, it is a trademark. I, I quite understand if in ASCII domain name you register North.com. But that, that's not infringing at all. That's not infringing to this trademark, to this company's rights. North is a generic term. Dot com is a generic uh, suffix. But when we introduce dot gongsi, it is equivalent to dot com. It's in Chinese, means companies, corporation, and registered north dot, well, <laughs> north dot company in Chinese. Well, it's a big company. It's exactly the trademark that's been registered. So it, it changed the assessment uh, of this, uh, uh, the, the first requirement in UDRP, paragraph 4, uh, uh, 1. So uh, these are some substantive issues I want to comment. The last point is on the UDRP services. One issue is about language capacity of the service provider. I do agree with Paul Wan, especially on this uh, language capacity of UDRP services. I know presently um, ICANN has uh, credited four service providers, and some service providers are not so localized, they're globalized. Uh, they don't have language capacity to resolve certain disputes uh, with special language requirements. I know some um, domain name registration agreement was actually in uh, Korean. But since there were no panelists who can understand Korean, uh, the service provider forced the party to adopt English uh, as a language of proceeding. This is extremely unfair uh, to, to the party and, and may really influence the outcome of the decision. Oh, oh, oh okay. I guess I ran out of time. That's something I want to talk about. That is. Thanks.
Thank you, Hung. Uh, thank you for your perspectives on uh, UDRP and its applicability to IDNs. I take this opportunity now to um, invite Rajesh Agrawal, who is the uh, CEO of uh, National Internet Exchange of India and also who is uh, heading the .in registry, to give his perspectives on the legal issues on IDNs. Rajesh. Uh, please, you can proceed to speak from the dais. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, as co-host of this meeting, I must thank all of you for coming here without any fear, even after the Mumbai incidents. So we are really delighted to see all of you here because we are quite worried that we may see a few dropouts. Uh, my earlier 